Rich Funky on sports. This is News Team 10. Good evening. Your four-year-old could be forced to go to preschool if Governor Cuomo has his way. That's one of the proposals in today's State of the State address. The governor sounding more like an elder statesman trying to ease the nation into the 21st century. Bob Longo tells us education was high on his list. The speech was vintage Cuomo. A mixture of eloquence, style, and emotion. A wide range of topics and programs were mentioned, but the underlying theme centered around New York's youth. Not just for this year, not just until the next election, the message calls upon you to make the next 10 years the decade of the child in the state of New York. Under the plan, Cuomo wants legislators to increase access to prenatal care, improve overall health insurance coverage for the poor, and step up efforts to prevent teen pregnancies. With the 21st century just 12 years away, Cuomo repeatedly stressed the importance of upgrading the state's educational system. His futuristic approach includes universal pre-kindergarten education for four-year-olds within five years, working towards reducing the dropout rate by half within five years, and creating a new Liberty Scholarship program designed to give disadvantaged kids incentive to get a college diploma. It would go to every seventh grader from a low-income family in the state and would say to that seventh grader that we, the state, will guarantee that if you finish school, if you persist, if you get your diploma from high school, the state will supply whatever financial help you need to complete a college education in this state. Local lawmakers like Senator Quattrochaki and Assemblywoman Penny Cook like the plan. Others like Assemblyman Bob King want more. All will get their chance to voice opinions when the legislature gets down to nuts and bolts in the weeks ahead. Bob Longo, News Team 10. Former Syracuse Mayor Lee Alexander faces up to 10 years in prison today. He pleaded guilty to extortion and blocking a federal probe as part of an agreement with prosecutors. That deal also calls for the ex-mayor to forfeit more than $500,000 in proceeds from his scheme. Alexander was indicted last July on 40 counts of wrongdoing. Lake effect snow dropped on the city today. Numerous multiple car accidents reported throughout the area and hazardous driving conditions all over. Why the change? Mark Finan has the answer. Mark? Well, it was a rather subtle change that made all the difference. Here's how it looked yesterday. We had a rather brisk westerly wind, and that dumped all the lake effect snow up around Pulaski, where they picked up about 30 inches of snow. But a subtle change today turned those lake effect snow showers our way. The wind went more west-northwest, and so those bands became, uh, came off the, lake sh the south shore of Lake Ontario, and that's why we got the snow in Rochester, and many locations right along the south shore picked up in excess of six inches of snow. I'll tell you how these are going to change over the next 24 hours or so in just a couple of minutes. Thank you, Mark. With reports of several feet of snow falling along the eastern shore of Lake Ontario, David Biggie set out this morning to report on the cleanup. But he didn't get very far. Another wall of winter weather has moved in. If you were driving along the eastern Lake Ontario shoreline today, this was the scene. Mile after mile, bitter cold and blowing snow, in a word, miserable. In nearby Walcott, the snow was coming down faster than store owners could shovel, making a mess of Main Street. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it because I'm too old to shovel anymore. But I gotta get out anyhow. Road crews were out all day trying to clear the way for motorists, but with high winds and blowing snow, visibility was limited at best. This is the second straight day wind and cold weather has pounded upstate New York for motorists that have to drive in the stuff. The only refuge is places like this where they can stop off for some hot coffee and something to eat. The main talk around the coffee table, why me and why now? But it was sunny in Rochester. I left it was sunny. My husband's going to kill me when he finds out I'm on the road. <laughs> That's all right. We wanted to do some skiing, but I don't even know if we're going to make it to, to go skiing. You hope there's not a real serious emergency that you have to get to in a hurry because you're just not going to be able to do it. You have to, you know, take your time. There were some who enjoyed the white stuff, but for most, it was an unwelcome visitor to western New York. In Wayne County, David Biggie, News Team 10. With a sub-zero wind chill, tenants of a Lake Avenue apartment woke up this morning afraid their heat might be shut off by Rochester Gas and Electric, all because the landlord hadn't paid his bill. 
That's when tenants called the action team and Pete Dobrovich stepped in. Pete? Hopefully they're watching with the heat on still tonight, Gabe. Now you pay your rent, utilities included. You don't worry about the heat being shut off. That's what the folks at 406 Lake Avenue thought. That was until they got these notices from rg and &E that the plug would be pulled today. But in hours, things took a dramatic change for the better. For the past few weeks, tenants here have received several warnings in the mail from rg and &E. It's a state regulation. Seems landlord Michael Fisi owed 4400 in bills. Heat would be shut off today, and tenants were up in arms. My rent is paid. That's it. zap it do So you shouldn't have to worry about the heat? No. If he's not paying his bill, you understand there should be some kind of rules and regulations. There is. After our call, our genie officials came to meet the tenants face to face with good news. But I can assure you right today, the utility service is not going to go off in the building. The landlord has agreed to start paying up with our genie in a week, but tenants were told of another option, forming a tenants association. They could meet the owner's current bills only, deduct that from their rent payment, send it to RG&E and send the balance of the uh, rental payment to their landlord. That's their, their right under state law. Okay. And he would have no recourse to come around later and say, wait a minute, I didn't get my full rent, you owe me some money here. That's correct. Literature about tenants' rights was distributed throughout the building. For now, the tenants say they'll wait to see if the landlord makes good on his promise to pay by the 15th. If not, it's clear by the enthusiastic response that by the 16th, they will form an association to put the heat on the landlord and keep it on in their apartments. What we're saying is, if, if the landlord gets in trouble with us, you're not going to suffer. Right. Okay? That's right. Yeah. Well, now this afternoon, landlord Michael Fici told me he will make that payment, not on a past due bill, but on what he says is a security deposit payment that he owes rg and &E. Now, any tenant in a similar situation can form an association and use the rent money to pay off a landlord's heating bill. rg and &E has the easy-to-fill-out forms, and it is the state public service law. If you want more information, call us at the Action Team, 454-3030, weekdays. From 11 to 1, Gabe, on a night like this, no one should have to go without heat. Utility appears to be doing its part to help out. Taking some nice steps today. Good response. Thank you, Pete. Still ahead from News Team 10, a north side fire leaves four homeless. And preventing future fires. It's the first of its kind in the country. A fire prevention curriculum was unveiled in Rochester today. I'm Laura Saxby. I'll have the details. Plus, smoking is the cause of last night's fatal fire on West Main Street. 66-year-old Ross Neville died from smoke inhalation. At least a dozen people were left homeless as a result of that blaze. And it was an unattended kerosene heater that sparked the fire Monday night in Dansville. We're told the huge blaze started in the ceramic shop at the old Dansville grain store. A child playing with a lighter is being blamed for a smoky fire in the city this afternoon. The home at 3 Wellesley Street was heavily damaged by the blaze, which took about a half hour to control. No one was injured, although four people from the two-family home are homeless tonight. Teaching elementary students the danger of playing with fire is the object of a new curriculum introduced today. It's the first of its kind in the nation. The pilot program is a joint effort of the City Fire Department, School District, and University of Rochester. Laura Saxby has details. Six people died in this fire on Elgin Street, set by a three-year-old playing with a lighter. The W.J. Grinder Roofing Company destroyed in a fire set by children. It's a real problem, but 65% of the kids who set fires are just curious. Once educated, they don't do it again, and that's the idea behind this project. So we're going to make an impact. Maybe not right away, but I say in 10 years, you're not going to have the number of fires started by young people. 45 teachers from five city schools will be testing the curriculum. The hope is it will satisfy children's curiosity about fire and do away with their desire to play with it. A second grade teacher at Nathaniel Rochester School led the team that wrote the curriculum. We're taking a step to deal with things before they happen. It's a proactive approach to things rather than what happens after the fire. The information came from five years of state-funded research by city fire investigators and U of R child psychologists. The $160,000 grant invested this time is expected to reach beyond Rochester. We think that the work that has been done here in Rochester uh, is representative of uh, the situation statewide and that it was uh, our goal to help the city develop programs that now other cities are going to take and implement locally. 
The teachers will take with them the material they received today, work it into their lesson plans over the next month, and then turn it in along with an evaluation at the end of February. It's hoped the pilot program will become a permanent curriculum. Laura Saxby, News Team 10. In my follow-up file tonight, the good works of a group known as Flower City Habitat for Humanity. Its goal to build homes for the needy. Last year, we showed you a project underway. If not a labor of love, it was a labor of goodwill. Members of Flower City Habitat, a nonprofit group, building a home for a family that could not afford a conventional mortgage. Therefore, would likely never own a home if not for folks like these. The construction here on 2nd Street was finished by summer's end. It was the beginning of a new life for Emma Sneed and her family. Six months later, as you can see, things are going quite well. But as with all home ownership, there are the surprises, the unexpected expenses. Well, the first thing we had was in the bathroom upstairs that was backing up. And the second thing was in the basement where we had to speak it problem. But it's all finished now. And it's, you know, it's nice to be here in this house and everything. Uh, Mrs. Sneed, her husband, and daughter Gloria are among the volunteers of Habitat who donate their time and skills. So far, the group has managed to build a half dozen homes for selected families. Emma Sneed told me this house has brought her family closer together. Yes, they, uh, we're getting more closer now since we got this house in. Final purchase of the house will actually take place later this year, with the modest rent being paid to Habitat now to be applied toward the down payment. The house is real nice, you know, it's warm, and it's, okay. it's better living condition than it was on the other street over there. Incidentally, Janet, the money for the lots and building materials is donated by individuals, community groups, and churches. Not government funded. Not a penny of it. The house looked great, didn't it? It sure did. Still decorated from the holidays. Mm -hmm. Can we say anything about the uh, great forecast? Well, the snow is almost over, and gradually it's going to get warmer. If you call that any good news, I'll have the forecast in just a minute. We have just a little bit of snow, but it's tapering off here in the city anyway. And we have a heat wave of sorts? Of sorts, yeah, we might get to the 20s a, a by ripple. Friday. <laughs> yeah, know. it won't be a wave, just a ripple, that's about right. And here's a, a weather shot that I can relate to. Uh, this is from Don Alfred of Rochester. This is a winter look at uh, the Brooklyn Country Club. And not much golf there going on today or for the next couple of days, I'm sure, maybe the next, not the next couple of months. Light snow right now downtown. The temperature at... 14 degrees, humidity rather high at 92% with a dew point of 12. Wind out of the northwest at 10 gives us a wind chill factor of about 5 to 10 below. And the barometer very high at 30, 44 and on the way up. Our weather watchers reported varying amounts of snow, but they all reported rather cold temperatures, generally in the teens. Cooler down at Bristol at 8 degrees and Perry also at 8 degrees. All of these areas down here reporting mostly clear skies, but up along the lake shore, anywhere from about 3 to 6 inches of snow. 6 inches of snow reported up around Sotus, 1 to 2 in the Fairport area, and about 3 inches, but most of it happened this morning up around Hilton and in Kendall. Now, earlier I spoke of the change that took place in the wind direction. We'll go back to midnight last night. You can pick up the snow squall band going across Lake Ontario and then up into the Pulaski area and then dip, dipping down into Syracuse. Now, as WeatherTrack puts this into motion, you can see the snow squalls begin to change direction, begin to come off of Lake Ontario down to the south shore, and that's why we had the snow this afternoon. And further back to the west, they're still coming off Lake Huron and still coming off Lake Michigan into parts of southern Michigan. And they're still getting some heavy snow back there, also across southern parts of Ontario. But I still think that these snow squalls are gradually going to be tapering off over the next 12 hours or so. And tomorrow, I think we'll only see flurries and generally just in the morning. We hit a high of 17 today. Last night we dropped off to about 8. We'll be in about the same ballpark tonight, especially near the lake. Further away from the lake, a lot of locations will go down to about 0 to 5 below. And right now it's only 2 degrees up at Messina. Elsewhere across the northeast, you don't find any warm weather. Still 4 degrees below 0 up at Ottawa and 9 degrees above back at Indianapolis. But that's not bad. This morning Chicago was at 14 degrees below 0. And further back to the west, under this cold high, here on South Dakota dropped down to 37 degrees below zero, but we're still under this very cold high and will be for the next couple of days. But keep your eye on the southwest. A storm will stream along the Gulf states and start to spread snow from Arkansas up through the Washington, D.C. and southeastern New York, too. I think this storm will just graze us, just bring us a dusting of snow on Friday. But if you plan on travel down to the south or to the southeast, keep your eyes on this storm. Let's take a look at our forecast for the rest of the night. Partly cloudy skies, a few flurries and squalls. 
in the more persistent squalls, some areas will get about two to four inches, but mostly just flurries to a dusting for the rest of tonight. Overnight lows about zero to five below. For tomorrow, mostly sunny after a few morning flurries. Daytime highs near 18. Our winds will be from the southwest at 5 to 15. Tomorrow night, partly cloudy. Lows in the single numbers. And the heat wave for Friday, a high of 22 with light snow likely. But right now, I don't think that's going to be too heavy. But stay tuned in case it takes a different course. All right. Thank G you, Mark. Give us the freezing point, at least. <laughs> I mean, Maybe next week. Mm. Thanks. Investors continue to pump up the market. Another day of gains today on Wall Street with the Dow finishing ahead more than six points. Among the local issues, Bosch and Lama's off one half, Kodak steady, and uh, Xerox, GM, both ahead a fraction. For more information, you can call 258-5800. 550 jobs have been saved thanks to some internal changes at General Motors. Workers at Rochester Products will remain on the assembly line, but company officials admit the plant's future remains in question. One option still under consideration to close the Lee Road plant and move operations down the street, but for now, there are no immediate changes at the engine assembly facility. Keith Gretzky looking a lot like his big brother, Rich, is next with News Team Sports. And Vanessa Tyler tells us if ice cream sales take a licking with this snow. Like today. Ice skating? Baseball. What other sport can stay in the news 12 months out of the year? Hey, George went to the candy store today. Big baseball news for Yankee fans today. You guys want a power hitter? You got one. Jack Clark is coming to New York. Clark signed a free agent contract today and became the first major free agent to sign with the Yankees in several years. Clark, who's been injury prone, hit 35 home runs in 131 games for the Cardinals last season. The Milwaukee Brewers have re-signed Paul Molitor, who grabbed headlines last season with that 39-game hitting streak. The U of R has been chosen as the team to beat when the Chase Lincoln First Area College basketball tourney begins a week from tonight. Seedings were announced today. The U of R is number one, Nazareth second, Fisher third, Geneseo fourth and Hobart fifth. And it's RIT, Roberts Wesleyan, and Brockport State. And Bill has more. This tournament has been the property of Nazareth College, the winner of the last four years, and clearly the class of the area programs during that time. But a fifth straight title is going to be difficult. We've really been happy with the successes we've had in the past, uh, but this is a new year. This is a new group of kids. We can't live on our past reputation. We've got to just go out and, and play aggressively and play hard and play with confidence, and I think we'll be okay. If you had told me uh, four years ago that we'd go four years without winning a tournament, that we won two or three years, uh, you know, I wouldn't have believed it. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's a tournament I want to win. The sleeper could be Fisher, seated third despite beating Nazareth in the recent Rochester Classic under first-year head coach Bob Ward. You know, we go through fluctuations where we have, you know, ten really good minutes and then four or five bad minutes. I, you know, I'm pleased with where we're seated. I don't, I don't even know if we're that good to be seated that high, to tell you the truth. Action begins next Wednesday and Thursday with the first round at RIT and Roberts Wesleyan, the semis and finals at the U of R Friday and Saturday. Bill Pucko, News Team 10 Sports. And Siena is up next for Syracuse Saturday night. The Orangemen opened the Big East schedule with an easy win over BC last night here on TV 10. Ronnie Cycli and Derek Coleman each had 19 points, but it's the SU defense that's been the big difference in the past few games. I thought we did a good job defensively, and, and Sherman did a great job defensively with Barros, and our big guys inside dominated the defensive end. Uh, we didn't play that well offensively, but defensively we did a real good job, and, and that was really the story of the ball game. Defensively, we played well. The Amherst held their final Rochester workout this afternoon before hitting the road for four games beginning Friday night in Sherbrooke. Rookie Keith Gretzky takes a six-game scoring streak into Sherbrooke. He scored 13 points and three goals and 10 assists in a half dozen games while getting a regular shift. I'm getting a chance to play a regular and, you know, uh, playing Jody Gage and, and Bobby Logan, whoever's on the left side, it really helps me out. He's really smart, you know, he's got a lot of hockey sets. I guess he gets that from his brother. He, he, he knows where I am all the time and uh, he's not a selfish hockey player. He likes, he, li he likes to get me the puck. Gretzky is nearing the halfway point of his first pro season and has 27 points in 29 games and the transition to pro hockey continues. I think I'm used to, you know, I thought what it was and, you know, I, you know there's things that, you, you know, are different than junior hockey, of course, and, you know, the guys are stronger than that. You know, uh, just got to go and work hard for 60 minutes. And our congratulations tonight to two area high school athletes who've won state honors. Greece Arcadia striker Mike Bianchi has been voted Gatorade's Circle of Champions High School Soccer Player of the Year 
in New York State. He's eligible for national honors. And Aronikowitz, David Walker, a linebacker and running back who helped the Indians to the AAA championship, has been named to the first team All-State squad on defense. That is sports. Good for them. Thanks, Rich. Up next, where the chill is the thrill. <laughs> team Sesame Street fun at the War Memorial. Steve Scully explains the governor's plans for preschool and college education. Dr. Dina Bell shows you a heart drug's unusual connection to history. That and more from the news team at 11. You know, some people just shudder at the thought of it. Others are dishing it up like there's no tomorrow. What is it? Vanessa Tyler has the scoop. How would you like, on a day like today, to eat something as cold as you are? I eat ice cream all year long. I love it. <laughs> ice cream's good all year round. It appears the majority of people have enough cold, frozen substances to deal with, and the thought of eating ice cream just gives them the chills. Yeah, it's too cold out there outside of eating ice cream, and, and I think that's a crazy gesture for anyone to get a, eat ice cream and then walk out in the cold. The only people that don't like to eat ice cream are the people that are probably allergic to it. Allergy or not, many buy ice cream between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Sales peak during June, July, and August. Now sales are as slow as the topping on a hot fudge sundae. Some people comment on, on the cold weather and eating ice cream. Not too many. Most people buy milkshakes in the wintertime. People that are, you know, want to go out and love ice cream, they come out and they buy it anyway, no matter what the weather is. And the buyers are using any excuse to eat it. By eating the ice cream, I, I lower my internal body temperature, and then, therefore, the outside temperature doesn't feel as cold. Wouldn't it make you more cold by eating No, no, it makes you feel good. Ice cream connoisseurs say you don't really need warm temperatures and sunshine. All you really need is your favorite flavor. Enjoy your ice cream. Vanessa Tyler, News Team 10. Raspberry sorbet. Mm. Quick correction. Quick I said Syracuse playing Siena. I don't know where that came from. Seton Hall they play on Saturday. Thank you for watching. See you at 11. Mm -hmm. Good night.